Greetings and salutations. Welcome to a video about audio. Today it's a twofer. We're going to talk about two Audio Technica phono cartridges, the ATVM 95EN and the ATVM 530EN. Some of you guys have been waiting quite some time for a review of the VM530, and I'm sorry it's taken so long. We're doing it now. And I wanted to go ahead and do both of these cartridges at the same time because they have a lot in common. And I think for a lot of folks who are looking for a phono cartridge, uh, they want a little bit better quality out of their records than they're getting with uh, the lower end stuff. These might be a really good choice and you might want to just consider between the two of these. They give you excellent quality audio at the price point. They are not perfect cartridges by any stretch of the imagination, but they have a lot going for them. I am not being paid by Audio-Technica. They did not give me these cartridges. I bought them, and I'm going to give you my impressions of them, uh, how they performed on my equipment. I've had them on three or four different turntables over the last two or three years, and I have a lot of experience with this particular uh, set of cartridges. Uh, so I do have a lot of insight. This is not going to be a scientific review with all kinds of benchmarks and audio samples, though. It's just my experiences with them and the experiences of some of the people that I know who use them as well. I want to give a shout out specifically to Phil. He's got a YouTube channel called Hitstown USA, and he's a bit of a cartridge nut like I am. And he has posted a lot of videos uh, with the ATVM 530EN and other carts in that series, along with Ortofan and Nagalka and even a Shure or two. Uh, so it's always good to check his stuff out. And he puts up real high quality stuff. So that's Hitstown USA. Before we get into talking about the carts themselves, I wanted to take a few minutes and kind of go through some phono cartridge basics. If you've seen any of my videos from the past about this, you may have heard this already, or you might be somebody who already knows all this stuff. So if that's you, feel free to skip ahead and find something else interesting in the video. But if you're new to records and you haven't seen anything on my channel about phono cartridges before, I encourage you to stick around. You might learn something here. So we start out with this lovely simplified graphic of a magnetic phono cartridge and this comes to us from U-Turn Audio. They make the Orbit turntable and they are also really cool people. No, they didn't pay me to say that. I just happen to like Ken and the gang and I'm using their graphics so I figured I'd give them a shout out. The cartridge itself starts from right to left with the pins that you plug in on the back of the body. They are connected directly to the coils and the coils are in the presence of a magnet which are attached to a cantilever there is some sort of suspension in the middle the cantilever sticks out of the front of the cartridge this is what we think of as a needle and then at the very end there is a diamond stylus and the construction of that stylus and the shape of that stylus greatly determines what kind of quality you're going to be hearing from the record it's really a simple device. The stylus tracks in the groove. It causes the vibrations that were cut in the groove by the uh, cutter head to vibrate the cantilever, which then in turn vibrates the magnet. And the coils generate electricity, which corresponds to the pattern of the sound in electrical impulses that is sent on to the preamplifier and then on to the amplifier and your speakers and turned into stuff that you can actually hear. Uh, one of the things that people mistakenly think is that somehow or another the stylus reads the audio or interprets it. Actually it doesn't. It's a live performance every time. It's just that the groove sets up a vibration which is immediately turned into electricity. That's it. Very simple design. One of the most important aspects of setting up a phono cartridge on your turntable is tracking force. I can't overemphasize how important it really is because a lot of audio issues that people report 
have to do with tracking errors induced by not tracking with the right tracking force. There's a myth that goes around that the lighter you track, the safer it is for your records and you won't cause damage to your records if you track under the recommended tracking force. That is absolutely not true. It's the other way around. It is much better to track above the recommended tracking force or at the tracking uh, recommended tracking force than below it. Tracking below it will cause the stylus to mistrack. It does not have enough downward force to keep contact with the groove walls and therefore it leaves contact with the groove walls and slams back in and if it does that hard enough it'll start tearing vinyl out remember we're talking about diamond against soft plastic and in that case you're going to hear that distortion it'll be a hashy sort of nasty sound and on S's and cymbals you may hear a click or a pop or a, a splatter that's called sibilance distortion nine times out of ten that is from uh, tracking error or stylus shape not being able to keep up with uh, the modulation in the record for whatever reason and if you hear that in excess you know that you're damaging your records so when you set up your cartridge be sure and run at recommended tracking force or above and some of the older cartridges way back a long time ago would give you a really wide range they would say like it tracks between two and five grams and what they wanted you to do with that is to start out at two grams and then listen to highly modulated music or whatever a test record and keep adding it until you get to the point where you no longer hear the distortion so that was the old way of doing it these days the cartridge manufacturers tend to give you a stated tracking force that's recommended for the cartridge and most of the time it's fine but on occasion you may get better results if you turn that up just a little bit maybe like a quarter of a gram or go near the top of the range if you find yourself in a situation where you are running a lot of tracking force above the recommended and you still hear problems in the sound distortion high sibilance that could indicate that there's something wrong with the stylus maybe it's chipped or it's worn or it's just not going to work properly and I've actually bought cartridges that showed up that way and no matter how much tracking force you put on it it still sounded bad and I would send them back so let's talk about stylus shape there are really three basic shapes and that would be the conical the elliptical and the advanced shapes this graphic has been floating around on the internet for a long time it's from Audio Technica so we start moving left to right and the first stylus which is shown as the most common stylus in the world that's called a bonded conical stylus a bonded conical stylus is a chip of diamond at the end of a little metal shank that's held on with cement and the shank is cemented to the cantilever so that's a bonded stylus and it's called a conical stylus because the shape is simply like a cone or a ball the surface area that contacts the record with a conical or spherical stylus is very small and it's usually ground to where it's going to be at 0.7 mils now in phonography we like to mix and match our measuring systems so this may drive some people in other parts of the world crazy but it's just the way it is so when we talk about stylus construction and we make measurements we're talking about mils as in one one thousandth of an inch we're not talking about millimeters whereas when you talk about stylus uh, tracking force or anti-skate pressure that's expressed in grams so go figure that's just the way it is so with a conical stylus for stereo records it should be 0.7 these days 0.6 is the common standard out there and the advantage of having that slightly smaller ball go down into the groove is that it tends to track below any damage that's done by older 0.7 styli and well below uh, one mil styli that were used on mono records before stereo came along and that's good so you don't hear that damage and it also gives you a little bit more high frequency detail but one of the drawbacks of a conical stylus is that they can only resolve so much detail that's in the groove and that's because of the shape if there's a lot of modulation in the groove and the stylus is moving back and forth at very high velocities then you tend to have a situation where that 
that ball shape can actually get pinched and so you have double action it's actually moving the stylus up and down and side to side at the same time which can cause distortion and it also means that you just don't hear the detail you're not going to hear things like uh, the valves on a clarinet or the pluck of a guitar string or a harp or something like that they, they tend to get glossed over but Conicals have their advantages. One of them is extremely low record wear. There are those who collect valuable 45s that were pressed on polystyrene that will play only with conical styli simply because they know that they're doing the least amount of damage to their records. However, if you want more quality, then you have to move up to an elliptical stylus. An elliptical stylus is shaped something like an American football. It has pointy ends uh, as far that point to the walls of the groove, and then uh, those are usually like 0.7 mil, which is the standard measurement. And then from front to back, there will be a, a skinnier measurement. Therefore, it's an ellipse, which is why it's called an elliptical. There are mild ellipticals, moderate, uh, medium ellipticals, and hyper ellipticals. So a mild elliptical would be considered a 0.4 by 0.7. Nagalka uses that particular shape for the MP110. It's also common on older Stanton broadcast cartridges. Uh, it's actually a really good sounding shape if the stylus is well made. And then the next step up is the 0.3 by 0.7. You see this very commonly on a lot of bonded styli. They advertise that. And unfortunately, when they're a bonded elliptical stylus, usually you don't get the performance that that would imply simply because of the fact that the stylus itself is bonded. It has a high mass. Uh, it might not be affixed perfectly. In other words, uh, it's not perpendicular to the walls of the groove, so therefore, who cares? It's, it's not tracking properly to begin with. There's all kinds of problems that can crop up. Moderate elliptical and hyper elliptical styli usually really start to show what they can do when you're dealing with a nude stylus, which means that it's all diamond, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So, a hyper elliptical stylus would be something like a 0.2 by 0.7, like the M97 XE cartridge that Shure was famous for in the old XV15s or the V15, the XV15 was Pickering, sorry, V15 is sure. Anyway, they had these 0.2 by 0.7 styli, which were very well made. I don't know whether they were nude or bonded, but either way, these things did not miss track, and they tracked at very light tracking force as well. So that would be considered a hyper elliptical. The XE is for extreme elliptical in M97 XE. And then above that, we have what are known as the advanced shapes. In this particular graphic, we have line contact, Line contact is a, a kind of a generic term for any stylus that has a very sharp edge pointing to the groove walls. And there are different kinds of styli that have that sort of characteristic, like the Shibata is one. And uh, then uh, line contact itself. There's also another brand name called Vivid Line out there. There's also a Vanden Hall stylus. And then on this particular graphic, they have Micro Line, which was... Audio-Technica's brand name for their most extreme stylus shape. When you get into extreme stylus shapes, now we're getting to a place where you really have to have a turntable that can take advantage of it. Everything needs to be set just right. You have to have your tracking force right. You have to have your vertical tracking angle. Uh, the cartridge must be properly aligned. Uh, the tone arm must be capable of you know, tracking without a great deal of resonance or coloring the audio or, or else you just don't get much out of these things. I've played around with Vivid Line and Shibata Styli in the past and yes, they do have a great deal of detail but they are so, also are very finicky. So I've come to a place where I'm really interested in elliptical styli. I'm not too terribly worried about advanced styluses. Also, an advanced styli can accelerate record wear if it's not set up properly and you should never play polystyrene 45s with an advanced stylus shape. Actually, uh, my research, and Phil has also done a video about this on his channel, we've pretty much come to the conclusion that as far as you want to push it for styrene 45s is a 0.3 by 0.7 stylus, and a nude stylus would be the best way to go to uh, present, prevent that uh, high mass on the tip from causing distortion. When you hear distortion, you're damaging a record. The lower the distortion, the less damage you're doing. It's just that simple. 
So here's finally a graphic which compares a bonded and a nude stylus. And you can see on the left that we have a bonded stylus. What that looks like, it's a bonded elliptical. And then there is a nude elliptical, which is a, a bigger piece of diamond. It's, it's more expensive because you are using a bigger piece of diamond. It's also more complicated to cut because you have to not only cut the tip, but where it connects to the cantilever. Now the advantage here is that it's very light and it's a direct connection and you usually get much better high frequency response when you move into nude styli a lot of the distortion goes away on really highly modulated records you might get a little bit of inner groove distortion but it really is a, the next step up be, beyond any of the bonded styli that are being manufactured today so i like to stick exclusively with uh, nude styli these days uh, you just get uh, better results. So let's start talking about the cartridges themselves. I want to talk a little bit about the series as well as the individual carts so you understand how it fits in with the grand scheme of things. Uh, the VM cartridge series, which is actually the next one we'll look at, was introduced about three years ago and then they in turn came out with the VM95 series. The 95 series replaces the Audio-Technica 95E, which is a legendary cartridge. Uh, they cost about 40 or 50 bucks, depending on where you could get them, and the audio quality was way above that price point. And back when Audio-Technica was making really fine 0.4 by 0.7 mil styli for that cartridge, it could outperform stuff that cost three, four times as much. Unfortunately, they don't make those styli anymore, and the modern 0.3 point by 0.7 styli for the 95E, the replacement styli, are, eh, they're not really good at all. I'm sorry. I used to be a big fan of the 95E, ran them for a long time, and now I've kind of moved on because the styli. The 95 is in many ways a worthy replacement. It's got some improvements over the the old 95E. Uh, I like the construction a little bit better. It tends to be a little more well made. And if you'll notice from this picture here, uh, you see that instead of having nuts and bolts, you just have some bolts that go down in the top, some screws that go into the cartridge itself. So it's really super easy to mount up. Everything in the series tracks at two grams. Uh, it's a nice, uh, the cartridge itself is nice weight and works on most tone arms. It's right in the middle. Uh, so some tone arms don't like particularly low mass cartridges and others have a hard time with higher mass cartridges. This is right in the middle. It'll work on pretty much anything. The styli are interchangeable on this series of cartridge and we can start out with the, the one upper left there. That would be the conical and it goes all the way up to a micro line. Uh, so it's a conical, it's a bonded elliptical, a nude elliptical. I think then it goes to Shibata. Let's see, maybe maybe we have them here. Uh, so we have the VM95C, that's conical. We have the 95E, that would be the elliptical, that's a bonded elliptical. And then we have uh, the 95SP, uh, which I'm pretty sure that that is a Shibata stylus. Is it? What is that? The SP. What does that stand for? Um, conical. Oh, it's 78. Never mind. That's for playing 78 RPM records, which means you need a big fat stylus, which is 3. SP is actually the old word for 78. It's the old term. It's, it's uh, short for standard play. So I just uh, haven't seen that in a long time. And, but yeah, that's what 78s are actually called is SPs, and then they have LPs and 45s. So anyway, the next one up is the EN, which is the one we're talking about today. That is a 0.3 by 0.7 elliptical nude stylus. And then the next one is the microline stylus. Uh, the next one after that, I believe, is the Shibata. Yeah, and the Shibata is the highest one they have here, and I think it's pretty much the most expensive. Being able to interchange styli like that is a really nice feature of this cartridge, and they all track at the same recommended 2 grams, which is actually pretty cool in and of itself. So how does it compare to other cartridges? Well, it, it actually sounds really good. Uh, when you compare it to a 95E, I think that the 95E beats it in stereo imaging. Um, this cartridge 
even with the elliptical nude styli, to me does not have the same sort of wide soundstage that you would find with the old uh, 95E cartridge. It's a little bit more limited, but it does tend to have a bit more detail and the high frequencies are definitely there. Uh, you get a lot of uh, good crisp sound from this cartridge. And at $119 for a nude stylus, this is an absolute steal. So anything I say negative about this cartridge is going to be uh, very just nitpicking. As far as the styli below the EN, the bonded elliptical, the conical, I have run those particular styli on this cartridge and I was not satisfied with either. The conical styli tracks pretty well, but there's very little stereo separation and very little detail. The bonded elliptical stylus sounds pretty okay, but there's definitely a, a limitation in the high frequency response. Plus, you get a distortion and sibilance on certain highly modulated records, and it exhibits inner groove distortion, which is more than just a little bit noticeable, even with very careful alignment. Like I have said in my last couple of videos, I don't think the world is making very good bonded elliptical styli these days. Believe me, the old styli that were in uh, the 95E and the styli that were available like on Stanton cartridges and Shure cartridges even just 10 years ago, the bonded ellipticals were much better. So I don't quite know what's changed. And we have all kinds of groovy pictures here of the cartridge. And there it is tracking a record. You can also buy these from Audio-Technica pre-mounted on head shells. You're still going to have to align it, but if you need a head shell, you can do that as well. Let's jump into the specifications here. Uh, they say the frequency response is 20 to 23,000. Rated stereo separation is about 22, B at one, 22 dB at 1 kilohertz. That's about right uh, from what I'm hearing. It's actually well balanced. It's just not super duper wide. Uh, it's still quite listenable, and if you're going to be using this on a turntable that you're going to be doing casual listening and not with headphones it's more than acceptable uh, then we have the tracking force uh, which is right around two grams and they have a very limited range they state here 1.8 to 2.2 i think that's just to make you think that this is uh you know that's super accurate the truth of the matter is is that this will probably track fine up to 2.5 <laughs> if you need that little extra uh so don't be afraid to experiment around a little bit. You're not going to break something. We have a nude round shank. Uh, the recommended load impedance is uh, 47 ohms. And, of course, the rest of this is pretty much uh, kind of the same stuff that you're used to seeing. We have an aluminum pipe cantilever, 0.3.7 mil elliptical. And then we have a stated uh, compliance here. Uh, one thing that I did want to talk about was the the weight. It's 6 grams. That's very nice for most turntables, 6.1. 17.2 millimeters high, which is in the middle. So if you think of a Shure M97XE, which is like 16 millimeters, and the old Stanton 500 would be 16 millimeters, and then uh, contrast that with the uh, Ortofons, which are usually about 19 millimeters high. This is right in the middle. It'll work on most tone arms. And then the recommended load impedance is 100 to 200 picofarads, which is damn near impossible to do. And a lot of the Audio-Technica cartridges state this. You're going to get um, that kind of capaci capacitance out of the cable itself and the lead wires on the tone arm. And this sometimes can cause problems uh, with your frequency response on certain uh, setups. Now, this cartridge seems to be better at handling that problem than the next one we're going to look at, the 530EN. But you might want to consider using an outboard preamp that you can adjust the load capacitance a little bit. Uh, you might get a more pleasantly balanced sound if you're not hearing that already. On my Pioneer amplifier, I have an A10AE and that has a built-in phono preamp which I'm using for this cartridge. It is definitely bright. It has a lot of high end, but it is not harsh. It's very nice actually. I tend to like cartridges that are more on the bright side. I, I think the latest crop of cartridges that people are touting their quote-unquote warm vinyl sound, I think that's a bunch of BS. 
the truth of the matter is there's high frequencies on records. Uh, engineers didn't purposely record them to be quote unquote warm. There's a fine line between warm and muddy. I would much rather have the reproduction be a little bit more bright than than warm because uh, when it gets past a certain point, it just sounds like mud to me. But that's my personal preference. So this one seems to be more uh, tolerant with different cables and uh, different uh, amplifiers. And the overall performance is really good. It tracks really well. You don't hear a whole lot of sibilance. Uh, there's almost no inner groove distortion. I've thrown a lot of records at this particular cartridge, and pretty much all of them have, have tracked very well, very satisfactory. There's nothing that jumps out at me and says, oh, I didn't like that. Uh, so yeah, for a casual listening environment, the VM95EN is a great cartridge. Would I upgrade the stylus past that? Well, I've already stated that I'm not really into that idea, but actually I think that probably the EN is as far as you'd want to go with this particular cartridge, even if you had a, a turntable that would maybe uh, do well with an advanced stylus shape. I really honestly can't see that much of an improvement in sound simply because of the construction of the cartridge itself and the coils. This is about the best this cartridge can do, and when it is running this stylus it, it plays a large variety of records very well and I think most people would be very happy with this for casual listening so I definitely give this a thumbs up and I don't have a lot of negativity to say about it especially because of the construction I love the newer cartridges that don't have the nuts like the uh, you know the Ortofon 2M series and this these cartridges and um, several others on the market now have done away with the, the little nuts that you have to hold that up on the head sh uh, head shell and try no it's a big pain in the butt so yeah i get a thumbs up for this cartridge it's definitely well worth the money at 119 dollars it sounds better than a lot of things i've heard that cost more now let's move up the food chain a little bit and let's talk about the vm series from audio technica this was a big deal when they were introduced. Uh, the very first models in the VM series were somewhat a little bit maybe disappointing. I think that was due to stylus quality, especially on the bonded styli for the conical and the EN. Very similar type situation. You have the same body, and as you move up, uh, you can upgrade within uh, certain limits. Like if we start out here, uh, for instance, here is the 510CB. That is a conical bonded stylus. And that one runs about a hundred and it's hundred and nine dollars list. Uh, then the the five twenty EB. Now that is an elliptical stylus, and it runs for five nineteen. And this has a bonded elliptical stylus, which doesn't sound that great. I'm sorry. Really, you need to drop the extra money and go ahead and buy the five thirty EN here, which is a hundred and seventy nine dollars and that extra cash is going to get you a nude elliptical stylus which performs marvelously. It's absolutely uh, amazing how good this cartridge sounds, especially with headphones on. It's unbelievable. The stereo imaging on this cartridge, it's really top-notch professional. It just sounds wonderful. And this is the cartridge that I am hooked up, have hooked up right now. If I was going to do a transfer, for instance, to give somebody a copy of a record in a digital file. This would be the cartridge I would go after. It has that sort of a plum and that refined sound that you really want in that sort of a situation and for very critical listening. As we go on up here, we've got the micro line, and I think this goes on to uh, uh, the 610 mono, uh, which is a, a, a that's a cartridge that's designed to play back mono records. Uh, what else do we have in the line here? We've got the, we already, that's the 540 micro line. Now that's got a different body. So when we get up to uh, these different cartridges, the VM series, we're talking about now refinements with the body and the styli might not be interchangeable. There's a chart somewhere on this website that allows you to figure out what is interchangeable with what and what all these different things mean. So yeah, it's a pretty big line of cartridges and it replaced things like the the 110 and the 100 and the uh, the 120, which was a really great Stanton cartridge, and uh, 
So this is the kind of the medium line of the Stanton series. You can you can get moving coil cartridges from Stanton that are much more expensive. Is it worth $179? Yes, with a caveat. So we're looking at the VM uh, 530EN. This is the particular page on the the website here for this particular cartridge, and it talks about the bond uh, the nude elliptical stylus rather. And we got some nice pictures of the product. This is what comes with it. You get a stylus brush, uh, you get a bunch of screws, and yes, this does require nuts to mount to the head shell, but uniquely it's done upside down. The screws go up through the bottom of the cartridge and then you thread the nut on the top, which makes it easier uh, than going the other direction. And you absolutely have to mount it that way. There's no other way to do it. As you can see, the construction inside the cartridge is very different from what we saw inside the VM95E and we have that lovely chunk of mu metal there between these rather robust coils and what this does is it keeps the channels very well separated so there's no chance for crosstalk between the coils either magnetically or electrically because they are divided there. Uh, the cantilever tends to be a much better construction than you find even on the VM uh, EN stylus uh, like I said, this is just a really nice sounding cartridge. So let's take a look at the specifications. 20 to 25,000 for your uh, frequency response. I can't hear to 25,000, so I can't vouch for that. But as far up as I can hear, it sounds good. 27 dB at 1 kilohertz channel separation. Uh, yeah, it definitely does that. The channel separation is great. It is not the widest stereo image that I've heard from a cartridge. That would have to go to like Stanton 680s with the uh, elliptical styli on them, uh, but they just don't build anything like that anymore. They had like 35 dB of stereo uh, separation. 27 is definitely adequate though. I'm not complaining. The cartridge tracks very well at the recommended 2 grams. I don't think you'll find yourself jacking around with it to make it sound good. Um, 47 ohms is the recommended load impedance. And then we come down once again. We take a look a little bit further down the list. Let's see, where is it? It's here somewhere. And we got 100 to 200 picofarad for the recommended load capacitance. That's really hard to match. Now... Some reviewers who have talked about these particular cartridges complain about the fact that they have a very crisp, almost punched out high end. And this is going to depend on your phono preamp. Some preamps load this thing up properly and others don't. So if you're going to invest in this cartridge, you might want to get yourself something like a Shite Manny which is uh, going to give you the ability to adjust the input impedance and maybe tame that high end a little bit. For instance, if I take this cartridge and I put it on my, just my, the, the preamp that's built into my Pioneer uh, with a really good cable hooked up to it, with a, a low impedance cable, it, it just is so bright that you don't, you don't want to listen to it. It really is hard to, to get along with. But... What I do with this cartridge, and I have an Audio-Technica turntable that has a built-in preamp. The uh, AT, uh, what is it? The it's the uh, it's the LP40WN turntable, and it has a built-in preamp, and so therefore it loads properly. And on that turntable, using the built-in preamp, uh, since the loading is correct, it sounds crisp still. It has a lot of high end, but it's definitely not overdone. It's a very flat sound. Uh, so that might be an issue. Uh, like I said, it depends on how your phono preamp and your cabling and your turntable and all that stuff reacts with the cartridge. That's what gives them the extra bright sound. But you could be like me and go, I'd rather have it brighter than duller. So it's entirely up to you. Uh, these are great cartridges. And it, it's all there. Even if you end up having to run a little EQ on it later on, let's say that you're using this to transfer files, you're going to end up with everything there. You've got it all to work with, and then you could tame that back down if you wanted to, if it wasn't working uh, the way you wanted it to with your uh, preamplifier. Um, it sort of kind of, on some records, makes it sound like a CD. 
and but it doesn't really ever go to being too bright at least for my ears with the proper load on the proper preamp it sounds fine it's it's very crisp uh, it is once again comparing it to the Stanton cartridges of yore back when you used to be able to get really good styli for them it gives me that sound the Stanton broadcast cartridges always had a very crisp high end to them and very well balanced and so I like the sound of this cartridge uh, but I'm just warning you depending on your system you it might be a little bright for you overall though for the price and for the performance that you get I don't think you can beat either of these cartridges I would recommend the 530 EN be used on a turntable where you can get a very precise alignment and the, the tone arm is capable of really tracking this cartridge where it needs to be tracked. Uh, so for instance, I've not, I don't use this on my U-turn Orbit, although I think the Orbit could handle it. I am using the VM95 EN on the Orbit and it's fine. So uh, yeah, that's my pretty much my review of these cartridges. I love them and I, I, I intend to stick to them because the cartridge market right now has gotten a little weird. You know, Stanton's just about gone. I think they have one more cartridge on the market. Sure is definitely gone. Uh, the Nagalka cartridges sound good except you really need to get into like the uh, higher numbers there like the, the Nagalka 250 and above to get the nice crisp sound. The 110 is an unbelievably good sounding cartridge it just doesn't have the high frequency detail that I want uh, it's a little too warm for me these do it for me these do what I need them to do I just want to tack this on to the end of this video for those who are curious I talk a lot about Stanton cartridges and that is because I have a great deal of experience with them in radio stations over the years I have been working in radio since the mid 80s in and out uh, through my life and back then if you walked into a radio station you would see Stanton cartridges pretty much universally except I did work for one station that used Shure VM 15s and boy they were nice um, and people ask well why not track these today why not get these today and you know I have dumped a great deal of money into Stanton and Pickering cartridges they are available on eBay if you look carefully you can find them and I find that the big problem is you cannot get the styli anymore. There's a bunch of aftermarket styli that are available and they just don't do the trick. They don't track the way they should. Uh, I bought one recently for my Stanton 500 cartridge. I bought a Stanton 500 cartridge and then bought styli for it. So I paid like 50 bucks used for the cartridge, which was too much. And then I paid another $40 for the styli and then bought another one too. They just don't track right. Um, they're looking to be tracked at three grams. And in those, when you're dealing with the old conical style, that wasn't too bad, but I don't want to track that way today. And as, I don't want to track with a three gram conical. There's, there's better sounding, lighter tracking styli that are available in that category that I'd rather use. So even the ellipticals that are available for the Stantons, just, the quality just isn't there, which is unfortunate, even though the cartridges are available. Uh, so when I'm comparing them, I'm comparing them to my memories of them many years ago uh, when Stanton genuine styli were available, and that it really made a big, it makes a huge difference in the sound if you have those original Stanton styli, and they are made of unobtainium these days. They just don't exist. All the collectors have snapped them up. They're gone. And that's just the way it is. So anyway, thank you for watching the video. I know this one ran long because we did two carts. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the Stantons at the end. So if you've hung around this long, thank you so much. We will do it again soon.